thank you so much um thank you uh, so welcome all once again uh, today we have uh, i think uh, four teams five teams with us one two three four teams with us um <clears throat> who have different projects and we have a uh, discussion to innovation shan beg as uh, uh, leading the first dis the second discussion of uh, innovation so uh, i would like to directly welcome him and uh, introduce you all um he is just a 21 year old honor student at uh, Concordia University and is an American Canadian student researcher and entrepreneur and speaker. He is a CEO and founder of SB Innovations, a research development company focused on creating novel solutions for the world's most pressing issues. Uh, what simply started out as science fair projects led to Shan selecting an urgent global issue each year to develop a low cost sustainable solution. I think uh, it would be great if we uh, hear uh, all that he has done from his himself uh, so i would like to hand it over to shan and then once he has made his presentation uh, we'll ask our uh, participants to introduce themselves and start the discussion over to you shan thanks so much thank you if i if you don't mind just give me a uh, share screen privileges quickly please and I can share my presentation. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. All righty, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are calling in from. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm here today to talk about ideation and, and process innovation through a lens of a change maker because we hear all these fancy words and you know, in, in the corporate setting, uh, but what does it mean to to do so as as a as a as a teenager or as a person in high school or elementary school or as a university student? I think it, it's very much different, and so that's what I'm I'm here to talk to you about today. So, uh, as you were told, my name is Sean Beg, and I'm super excited to be with you all today. An honor to be a part of your journey and in your projects, and if I could be of any help, um, let me know. I'm all yours for the next. Uh, little bit. Let's change the slide. So just a brief overview of what I'll talk to you about today is a little bit about my story. What did I realize during this story uh, and, and my journey? And then I'll show you three steps of uh, how I was able to kickstart innovation in a very simple terms, uh, but it gives you kind of a, a rough structure of uh, what could be done uh, and what should be done. Uh, in terms of facilitating change making or facilitating innovation uh, as fast as possible. And the last um, thing I want to do with you guys is a, a four question activity. Uh, this four questions um, is, is something that I ask myself uh, when I'm working on my own projects, uh, but it was this uh, structured uh, set of questions that I developed with the director of MIT Solve. Uh, Alex Amuel, who's amazing in her own right. Um, so I'm excited to do that little activity with you all today. So a little bit about who am I? <laughs> you heard uh, about, yeah, I'm, I'm a student. I'm finishing my last year in honors kinesiology and clinical exercise physiology. Um, I speak around the world from time to time uh, when there is no pandemics. Um, and I, I, I'm also a social entrepreneur. I, I have two companies and, and I enjoy running them. Um, and, and before I, I give each of my talks, uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, what you do? And they always ask, you know, uh, predominantly older individuals, you know, what do you do for work? But I, I don't see myself doing a specific job. I see myself as solving the world's most pressing issues using science uh, and creating a world of equal opportunity in science uh, while doing so. And, and that's my goal um, for now. And it's my goal for the rest of my career um, going forward. And so my story started when I first started science fairs in grade six. It was an extracurricular where I saw you can pursue scientific research uh, beyond the confined walls of the classroom. And I immediately, you know, fell in love. I started doing uh, ice, uh, projects on ice hockey uh, here in, I, I'm calling from Montreal, Canada. And uh, as you probably are aware, 
Canada is cold and they love ice hockey, uh, the sport of ice hockey. And so I was testing the, how the flex of a hockey stick affects the accuracy and speed of a puck. Um, and that kind of was my introduction to scientific research uh, through a sport I loved. And the, while, I was in 13, while I was 13 years old, I created a novel design for a, a concussion helmet. I received a concussion myself and I wanted to kind of make a change in that area. And so uh, I was working on designing a hockey helmet that can absorb the most, the most forces. And I was actually uh, ended up working with this um, hockey company called Bauer, uh, which, um, you know, half of a professional hockey players wear this specific brand. And so it was, it was, a, it was a pretty unique um, opportunity. The following year, I discovered, I, I shifted to the medical sciences and I was working on uh, silver colloid and how that was able to kill prostate cancer cells better than the standard chemotherapy drug, rapamycin. And uh, this showed me that, you know, you can, um, you know, be involved in these high level projects that you only read about in the news while being in high school. And, and it really opened my eyes of, what was possible and what were my limits and that my limits, uh, you know, I can exceed my preconceived limits. And I think that's something that all of us should, you know, um, learn about early on. The following year, I wanted, I designed a, a, novel, a novel diagnostic strip. So it's essentially like a pregnancy test for, for bladder cancer. Uh, it's a piece of paper where we take a piece of urine uh, sample and if it changes colors, it means the person has um, bladder cancer. What was really cool about it is that um, there was nothing uh, to date uh, that we can detect early on bladder cancer. And this was the first of its kind and it was actually easily translatable uh, to other diseases. And so although it started as a science for project, I was able to uh, publish the research. I was able to work with pharmaceutical companies to kind of bring it to market and see how we could bring it to market. And uh, this initial project um, did show me what was possible in terms of entrepreneurship. And now you can translate these science fair or hackathon projects or coding projects um, to market as a high school student. And uh, that was kind of, monumental in terms of my journey as um, it kind of made me realize, you know, I can do this and it is possible. Uh, the following year, I shifted to neurodegenerative diseases, so Alzheimer's, and that's kind of where my focus uh, in academic research has been um, since I was 16 and uh, I'm 21 now. So uh, you can, you can uh, do the math to tell this is the uh, the area I've stuck with and that I'm most interested in. Um, so my grandfather was actually diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and it got me interested, read up and learned that one in three people will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's in their lifetime. And uh, that was a real eye opener. And at the same time, I love exercise. I love sport. And I was uh, seeing in this uh, project how uh, a specific part of the brain was responsible in preserving cognitive function in Alzheimer's disease patients. All that to say is there's a specific part of the brain that I discovered that, you know, even if you have Alzheimer's disease, you may be losing memory, you may be losing motor function, but if you uh, keep this specific part of the brain healthy, you won't experience those negative symptoms, even if you have the disease. And now you can keep that specific part of the brain healthy while doing exercise, um, which was uh, pretty interesting. It was in my last year of um, uh, the science fair world where I designed a molecular probe for a, the early diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So it's this probe that you can see on the screen uh, in the bottom. Uh, obviously this is an animation, uh, but it's injected into a person's bloodstream and make its way through the brain and um, attached to a protein that causes the disease and it lights up. And we can detect this light using FNR spectroscopy, which is kind of an X, a special X, right? You see in shows, it's like a cap and um, it'll light up and we can detect the disease early on up to 40, 45 years before the first stage. Uh, but it also has a therapeutic effect where it stays attached to that uh, protein that causes the disease, exits the brain, is filtered through the rest of the cardiovascular system, so the rest of your blood, and um, you pee it out. <laughs> you can pee out Alzheimer's in the project. And so with this project, I was lucky to represent Team Canada at, uh, you know, four international science fairs, winning best overall at one. And um, it, was, it was truly uh, 
uh, you know, looking back, it was one of those experiences that uh, is most memorable um, during my high school, um, I guess, journey. But, you know, why, you know, where did that even get me? Like, it's cool that you, you see these people doing science fairs, you see these people doing hackathons, even you, like uh, people may be asking you, you know, what's the point doing these, these projects early on? You're, you know, you're not, maybe you're not in university yet, maybe um, you're not in a, like the working uh, field yet. And people be, may be asking, you know, why, is it worth it? Well, I can confidently tell you that, you know, it is. I've gotten uh, incredible opportunities that I didn't think were possible and that can no doubt, you know, happen to you, it can easily happen to you. And so I was selected as a 2020 Global Team Leader by the We Are Family Foundation program I'll talk to you a little bit about earlier because their application's closing soon. Um, you know, I was able to get cool internships. I worked at Nuance Communications in that top left. Uh, they're a company who made Siri. And so at 15, I got an internship there to work on Dragon Drive, which is this car infotainment system in the front of uh, BMW, Honda, um, Toyota, um, and uh, Jeep and a few other car companies and um, it's in more than 200 million cars today uh, my my uh, my research on alzheimer's disease you know is focusing on alzheimer's but it's easily translatable to detect other diseases in the brain and so uh, other labs at like harvard oxford and yale are are using that design to detect other diseases in the brain but why did I tell you all this? It wasn't to flex or, or show, you know, this is what I did. Uh, but, you know, I, I did realize certain things. And I realized that it only takes two things to be a great scientist or to be a great entrepreneur as a young person. Firstly, it takes the perseverance to make something work uh, and the relentless nature to make this world a better place. And, and those two traits make a truly great uh, change maker. But to be a change maker means to kind of align your passions with your wanting to do good for this world. And so it doesn't matter what age, race, religion, or gender, anyone can have impactful change. And that truly fascinates me. But the most important thing that I learned through this journey was that the work of good science is not completed until communicated with empathy and compassion. And although I, I am saying a good scientist or the work of good science, I think that's true for most things. You know, you can see it in the world today, um, how it's truly important to be empathetic in the way you communicate your ideas. And, and that's only when your work is done. Um, and, and, and yeah, and, and so that kind of led me to create a not-for-profit organization called Young Scientists and Innovators to help teenagers discover their untapped extraordinary potential and give them the tools necessary to turn their ideas into a reality. And that's why um, I'm very much in line with the, you know, the, the goals and the mission of this conclave. And um, that's why I'm so excited um, to be with you all today. And so just to give you a, a better picture of kind of what we do, um, we group successful pine agents and venture capitalists and entrepreneurs. Um, we help in the kind of the specialized roles and develop a successful modern day business because I didn't know these things in high school. No one really knows these things in high school. Uh, and so that's kind of uh, the goal we're trying to do because the best way to predict the future is to create it. And so we're unleashing these crazy geniuses who won't sacrifice a return on humanity for a return on investment. Um, and yeah, you, I can, I'll send them some contact information if, if you do uh, think this can be helpful on your journeys. But that's not what I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm here to help you realize why it's important to be a change maker uh, and, and how we can kind of stream flow and, and, and facilitate this innovation and change. So this is why you're, this is kind of a three, my, my quick three-step process to promote innovation. The first step you probably already have done. All of you are working on a project, um, which I can't wait to hear about. Um, but you know, at YSI, my main focus is to develop social entrepreneurs who won't sacrifice a return on humanity for a return on investment. In other words, don't be a, a, a company that's bad for, for people. Right? Don't be a project that's bad for people. You want to help humankind at the same time as making money. Uh, and so this is the main priority in young scientists and innovators. Uh, you know, what it takes to be a great change maker is pretty much the same traits you see um, in, in, in companies who are focused on social good and the people who are behind those innovations um, are meant to you know, bring social good. 
And so uh, the three steps that we focus on why side to help you know young people create companies and innovations tackling sustainable development goals related issues is first find a hard problem so you already already have that done you know you're <laughs> yeah it should be a problem you're deeply passionate about because uh, that's what will allow you to work the hardest in it and uh, i have a friend ali from kenya and he once told me um you know speak courage fluently uh, but but start with empathy. And so it's this empathy that fuels us, uh, but most importantly allows us for an individual to make this world a more equitable and a more sustainable place. The second idea is who can we approach to make our ideas a reality? You know, you cannot wait for purpose to come to you because it just doesn't come to people waiting at the starting blocks. Um, you know, who can we approach uh, to facilitate this change? You know, I've had hundreds of rejection emails trying to get my projects off the ground simply due to my age or the fact I didn't have a few extra letters at the end of my name. You know, I wasn't a doctor or a master student. Um, so who and how can we approach people in power to evoke our change? The key is to have meaningful conversations with two types of people. One, government officials, and two, leaders in the private sector. You know, these are the people who have the most direct exposure to facilitate change and target a solution for a problem you're both passionate about. And so making a list and, and Googling online people who can have the same goals as you, who are working on incredible stuff in their own right, and, and kind of making a partnership with them, getting their knowledge on things, getting their advice on your project. It's these meaningful conversations that can really facilitate and, and get your idea off the ground quicker uh, than simply doing it without them or doing it with um, you know some sort of other person. The last step is kind of what we talked about earlier about communication, what I learned about how communication and um, community and science, you know, the work of good science is not done until communicated. Um, you know, whether it be a diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease or cleaning up plastic pollution in the rivers of Bali, people want to listen to an individual who has access to society in a way others don't. And a personal connection kind of becomes key in that sense. And so I really want you to be meticulous uh, when you're communicating and communicate your idea with purpose uh, because your goal is not only to, you know, get your project off the ground, you wanna share why it's needed to other individuals. And, and if you can explain it to a five-year-old and a PhD, that's when it becomes exceptional. I like to share this quote by Maya Angelou, who, you know, people forget what you said, people forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And so I, I hope you um, are more aware and, and have kind of this communication plan, whether it be with social media, whether it be making many documentaries. It's truly important to not just communicate to, um, you know, the business to business side of things, but it is important to communicate with, um, you know, just the everyday Joe. The last thing that I'll leave you with is um, four questions, and we can kind of go around later in, in the Q&A session. Um, these are questions to catapult you in the right direction. You know, I urge you all to ask yourself these four questions, which will allow you to reflect on what needs to be done going forward and pinpoint strengths and weaknesses. Um, and I, you know, like I mentioned, uh, I developed them with the director of MIT Solve. And so uh, we've been using this with participants in MIT Solve, uh, which is, um, you know, a, a, an incredible incubator being done in that sense. Um, but from what I hear, you guys are also doing incredible work. And so, um, you know, it should be used by you guys as well. So the first question is, what is your kryptonite? What are your shortcomings, your biases, your privileges? And the second question is, who are your allies? Who are your co-travelers? Who are the people who complement your shortcomings and skills uh, and experience? Who are the stakeholders you co-designed with? The third question is, how do you play the game while trying to change it? And the last question is, what can I do right now to start creating what I want? So in other words, how do you activate all the levers you can? So not just in your studies, not just in your career or startups you may already have, uh, but also your side projects, your volunteering, your giving, your investing, your purchasing, who are your friends, who are your family members, who can help? You know, especially in the past year, it may be hard to get the projects going, COVID and, and lockdowns, and I would not get too hung up on the fact of how screwed the world is. Instead, I would kind of tell myself, listen, Things are gonna happen both good and bad. And I have a responsibility um, of allocating some of the goodness in my heart to as many people as possible. And honestly, you're afraid of that. 
and all the stuff freaks you out, just get to work. Because at the end of the day, being a change maker means being someone who's able to inspire others, being able to adapt to the changes around you and, other, and being able to become the change that you want to see happen. And considering the year we've all had, we've all had to learn to adapt. Um, and so deep down, you're already a change maker. I wanted to share three programs that may help in your projects. And I'm gonna, you can Google them on your own time. <laughs> and I'm, I can definitely sell them to you um, later on if you're, you're, you're curious about each specific program. Um, but Eric Schmidt founded this uh, thing called Rise for the World. The first link application is closing in a day or two. I, I, I believe since I, <laughs> since I last talked to the founder, um, uh, but it definitely helps young people who have a specific project, who want to change the world. Um, they give uh, funding, they give mentorship. I, I truly believe uh, this could be of help. Uh, the thing I did was uh, the Global Team Leader Program. Um, they select 35 of the most influential teenagers making a change for the world and uh, make this world a better place. And um, of, they, they do have other programs available and you should definitely check it out. They are called We Are Family Foundation. The program is called 3.dash, so 3DD. Uh, but the thing I think anyone can get started on today is Pioneer. Pioneer.app um, is this online kind of a gamified experience where you share your project, whether it be a startup um, or, or, or something else. And, and it's, uh, it's all online to start with. Um, it's, it's kind of a tournament setting online. You share your progression and and you get to review other people's projects and people get to give advice on your work uh, during your weekly kind of updates um, and if you're selected at the end and you get enough upvotes you make ten thousand dollars in funding you get a free uh, round trip for a month to silicon valley um, and you get a bunch of cool experiences i met some of my best friends um, going through that and so uh, it's called pioneer.app um, and before I, we go on to uh, talk and, and, you know, I, I rather talk to you guys. So the conversation part is what I look most forward to um, with you and, and getting to learn about your projects. But um, what I want to leave you with is that we are, we're always told we're the next generation. You're always told you're the future doctors, lawyers, activists, engineers, um, that we are the leaders of tomorrow, but we do not need to wait until tomorrow to lead. And clearly you guys are already you know, embodying that notion um, by starting projects and having them already. So thank you so much for letting me join uh, you all today. And I'm so excited to um, talk with you all and, and get to know you more. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, uh, and also thank you for sharing those links as well. I think, uh, um, uh, everyone uh, will go back and look after uh, what uh, it can offer to them. So and thank you so much for pasting it in the chat as well so they can directly access th those links. So now I would like to ask our participants to one by one introduce themselves. And if they have any question, please go ahead and ask. So uh, who would like to go in first? We can start. Um, oh. So I'm Vail, I'm 15, uh, and I am leading the Carbon Footprint Reduction Project along with Pavil. Uh, he couldn't be here today, but uh, he had another class. Uh, but a bit about the project, we started the project, I think, six months ago. And the main aim was to conduct research on the science behind climate change. Um, so one of the major things that we're working on is a flights emission calculator, uh, which tries to, uh, which is basically a tool that people can use every time they decide to take a flight. And it tells them how much their carbon footprint is based on the route that they're taking and what time of the day they're flying and things like that. So uh, the main aim that we were looking at is when, when you talk to people about how you can reduce your emission from flights, it's basically take less flights, but that's not always possible. So how can we use this calculator to come up with other methods of reducing your personal carbon footprint? So that's one example. 
And then the other aspects of the project include, um, we're trying to develop solutions uh, and more, more than develop, uh, it's about personal action. So we're trying to conduct research on uh, various personal choices that one person can take uh, with let's say food or um, electricity and putting that out there to the audience in a manner where they are able to do a cost benefit. So we, we provide them with a cost benefit analysis and they can, they have all this information to effectively choose uh, the solution that works for them. And the final aspect of the project is a game show. Uh, this is essentially an event that, uh, that, that explores the connection between pop culture, like Harry Potter and Star Wars and things like that, uh, along with climate change. Uh, so how is nature integrated into pop culture? How is pop culture inspired by nature? And we do this through games and interesting discussions. And the aim is to essentially interest and start discussions within our generation because most people are bored of sessions that schools hold, which are super ineffective. Uh, so it's trying to it's trying to engage more audience and a bit about the team. We're about twenty five to thirty people, and we're all in school. We're either high schoolers or middle schoolers and things like that. And it's it's a passion project that we've been doing. So incredible work. That's 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 I I really like that idea. Um, and I'm just thinking like I know I I know uh, we can go into it later. Um, but that's something I can definitely imagining be on the side of, uh, when, you know, when you're booking flights, I don't know what's normally used in, in your country, but like in, in Canada, it's, uh, it's like Expedia in those sorts of websites. And so I can definitely see that being part and integrated in those kind of programs or embedded in those programs, uh, through partnerships. But I really like that idea. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Ved. Um, I think we have Bhavya as well. Uh, if you guys have any questions, Ved and Bhavya, please go ahead. Hi. Hi, Mira. Hello. Everyone, um, my name is Malina. Hello. Mm, Mira, I think we have some connection issue. So, okay. Going. Oh, I think there is some network issue. No worries. We can also write, if you have any questions, you can write in the chat. Or if, you, if your mic's not working, you can, you can just give a brief description in the chat and I can read it out. Uh, Mira, if you have any question, uh, you can type it out in the chat and we, we can pick, pick it up from there. Okay. Uh, next, Sam, would you like to go next? Sam? Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I hear you. So I think they're done. I think you're on new term. I didn't get I didn't get what you say, please. I really say. Yeah. I was saying, would you like to tell us more about your project and introduce yourself? Okay, please. Am I clear? Am I audible enough? Yes. Yes, yeah, I hear you. Okay. Okay. So my my project is on, is on climate education, and then uh, focus the getting every getting the effort of stakeholders and policymakers and even community people 
um, and giving them um, the promotion of climate education, giving them that, that giving them that sense about climate education, and so we get um, sustainable um, environmental practices. So our goal is promoting sustainable environmental practices among in communities why advocating for low carbon options for business and industry. So everyone, this project started last year. And then through this project, we've been able to we've been able to carry a series of climate and advocacy, action and engagement with policymakers, stakeholders, and even youth across different communities in Nigeria. We have been out of 30 states in Nigeria, we have been able to reach out to seven states and then engaging over 30,000 participants, which includes them um, youth and students. These are direct audience we have, but our indirect audience is, um, is running 200 because we, we know we, we have also been able to carry out um, campaigns, digital training, and then um, also um, policy engagement with policymakers looking at um, the ministry here in Nigeria and even the, the person that has the climate change view. The person of um, uh, somewhere only in Nigeria because before the bill was passed in Nigeria, we also engaged the team in Nigeria here. So, currently, we, we are facing the northern region of Nigeria to engage this project as well. And um, looking at the fact that the northern region of Nigeria is, is a region faced with um, violent conflict, so we are looking at organizing and um, Training that is geared towards climate education and also promoting peace building and climate leadership among youth in that region. Our project is well recognized in Nigeria as the first project dedicated for climate education in Nigeria. And then we are, we are endorsed by the Federal Ministry of Environment, supported by POP, and it's also a POP movement and project. The pop movement project that was flagged in Nigeria, the pop Nigeria initiative, and the project is specially for youth. However, we are not um, we are not having an oversight when it comes to community engagement too, because that is also what we have been doing in time past. And our impacts have have ranged from change of perception about what climate change is from community leaders and even youth. And um, another impact also is um, youth engagement in climate action across communities in Nigeria. And then um, establishment of gardens, three um, sustainable gardens in Nigeria, and also tree planting processes in Nigeria. And then um, as also efforts too created to make sure that our work goes locally, we are also partnering with other organizations in Nigeria and even outside Nigeria to initiate this project. As this project has been replicated in other countries, including UK. I remember UK SOS that the students organizing sustainability, organizing for sustainability, also replicated the same project in UK. Because when we wanted to flag the project, then they contacted me and said, please, this is not something that they are not um, a Nigerian based organization, neither do they promote um, Nigerian based work. But since they are not Nigerian based, that they would like to replicate it in their country. And I gave them a concept, and I gave them the concept, and also share that concept with them, which is also what they use as well in their climate education process. So, and apart from that, we also have in other countries as well that have also represented here in Africa. And then we have also organized projects like um, the first innovative cleanup we organized in Nigeria to tackle plastic ocean pollution in Nigeria was a project that was really sustainable. And also, I don't think any organization here in Nigeria has to carry this out because we, we um, donated them. Um, giant with basket to the beach. And this giant with basket is aimed at tackling 
it is to make way disposal by users of the beach. So instead of them going to the beach and after it's seen and using the plastic, they also fix at the beach. So what we did was to provide a sustainable waste basket, which is entirely for plastic, that they can be able to trash their plastic after you. And also we connected the recyclers as well. Once the basket is filled up, the recyclers can come and pick up the plastic or recycling. And this, according to the beach uh, management, this is the first project that anybody in Nigeria has carried out with such an innovative um, approach, which is a close to us. And we also educated um, students and trained you on green economy transition. This is also a major subject as well. So the project is, is diverse and also inclusive. Inclusive, I mean gender inclusive. Okay, so Sam, do you have any question? Sam, do you have any question for Sean? Um, actually, I had this project, and I feel it's also inspiring too. But then um, I also want to know about the inclusion aspect of the project, because you know the country right, if I'm not the country, the globe right now is driving towards inclusion. So how is the project inclusive in terms of providing advice and also how does it tackle as well gender? So I want to know the inclusive part of it. I'm taking so much time. In. No, no worries. Thank you for sharing your project. I just want to clarify, is is your question, I couldn't, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear. I think it's a connection thing on my end, but is it in terms of inclusion in my project or how can we in generally be more inclusive in our projects? Yes, yes. I'm talking about inclusion. How do you people promote or for now, the approach of inclusiveness in the program. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good question. And and before I, I forget, um, just listening to her project, I have a friend, uh, Josh Oluwashe, and he's from Nigeria and he's working, he's a, he's a climate activist out of Nigeria. He was a global team leader my year. And, and he's, uh, you were talking about how to get more engagement and, and community engagement and all that. So if you don't mind sending me a message, I'll, I definitely want to connect you both together because uh, he's doing incredible work. He was just selected as a 21 under 21 on uh, Vogue. Um, and so I, I think uh, he's he's focused on on getting stories out, especially with climate activism. So if you send me a message on, on Instagram or by email, um, I'll definitely connect you both if that interests you. In terms of inclusion, it really varies per nation, I think. For here in, in, in Canada and in the States, uh, recently inclusion uh, is focusing on getting uh, more, um, you know, uh, members of the LGBTQ+, plus, more, um, you know, representation when it comes to African-Americans. Um, these are, are the main focuses in, in Canada and the States uh, when it comes to corporations being more inclusive. But I don't think it just stops there, obviously. Um, you know, personally with young scientists and innovators, uh, we make sure that our process in terms of selection of individuals who come through our programs is the... Um, you know, we don't look at race, age, or gender, uh, or their level of education. We make our, our process uh, firm in the sense that we don't look at those things when uh, people are applying. We only look at ideas because ideas are worth sharing. And, and that's kind of our main focus. Uh, we also, um, you know, recognize that it's opportunities that are presented to certain groups of people that do show disparities amongst individuals. And so obviously uh, looking at, uh, you know, better, com like richer communities having better opportunities. And that's where kind of um, people become excluded when it comes to um, selection processes. And so we're, we ensure that our programs are being taken place in both uh, high income and low income neighborhoods. Um, schools with um, students who are predominantly under the, um, you know, the, the, the poverty line uh, here in Canada. And so I definitely think that 
having processes in those types of communities, it becomes easier. Um, but I don't think that's any different to climate activism and, and sharing ideas, uh, making sure they're in both individuals and that your team is, is truly diverse because if your team's not diverse, um, you won't be aware of certain ideas. Um, you know, I, I think about things um, differently than then my friend Josh from Nigeria, who's also a climate activist, thinks about things. And, and it's through our conversations that I realize, you know, maybe I should focus a little bit more on something. Um, so I think it's these conversations with, um, you know, people that are in this community. Uh, you can talk to Philo or or, or Bad. And, and, and I think that's um, having those conversations and having a team that's diverse um, or whether it be a group of advisors uh, that can help with inclusion but obviously it's more uh, you know simple said than done and it's all it's a uh, you can talk about this for hours <laughs> so um yeah but i definitely uh, definitely I'll, I'll share my contact info in the chat and for anyone else um, message me and um just give me a brief line about your project and I'll try to connect you but all um, with with someone who I know on my network who may be close to you, um, but especially used to I'm just gonna write in the chat quickly. But yeah. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we have a question for you in the chat by Meda. I would like to know what range of coverage Sean's project does cover. In Africa, we do have quite a number of young people with the dream of innovating to address human issues. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just reading that at the same time. Yeah, in terms of my project, if you're referring to the, the young scientists and innovators, um, it's, it's worldwide. Uh, we are very lucky that um, COVID has kind of shifted us in an online setting and it's become more inclusive in a sense that uh, we're not just uh, looking at um, uh, we're not just looking at uh, Canadian and, and students in that sense, uh, but it's really throughout the world. Um, and so uh, we are opening opening up our applications at the end of this summer uh, for our incubator uh, program. And so that's kind of uh, getting projects off the ground to, to corporations and giving seed funding. Um, but obviously that's at the end of the summer and I know <laughs> that's a couple of months away. Uh, so definitely looking at those links, especially the pioneer uh, thing, that's something you can start right now. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the range of uh, what we cover. We cover uh, funding, we cover mentorship and connecting you with uh, peoples in the private sector, but we don't, we don't only do that. We connect you with um, youth, uh, people making a change in those specific areas because, um, you know, the, the, we are, you know, the, the young people think differently in terms of these projects compared to older individuals this historically and so we think it's also important to have that kind of mentorship uh, be available to you as well uh, so yeah i don't know if i answered your question but i hope i did thank you sean um i also put a question in the chat uh, earlier okay let me okay. let me read it let me find it. If you don't mind, you can just read it off now, I, if you don't mind. Uh, basically, uh, so we being a student-led organization, we sometimes struggle where we can present our project and how we can uh, get more people to recognize our project and maybe sometimes get funding and things like that. So mm. um, how, how, how did you get it off the ground? Yeah, no, excellent question. I think that's the biggest issue that we all face uh, as young people doing projects. I think that's the biggest barrier when it comes to um, not necessarily getting our projects off the ground because if you have a project, you already got it started. Um, but in terms of uh, expanding it and, and growing it and scaling it, yeah, we definitely need funding. I personally found competing in science fairs and, and you know hackathons are available or um, you know kickstart competitions they're easily found online um, or through your school maybe uh, but those things are generally offer funds and so I was fortunate enough to you know win a few in science fairs and, and 
gain a sufficient amount that I kind of invested back into my projects or my organizations or future projects. Um, but I think there, that's kind of separate from getting the word out <laughs> regarding your project. And I think once you win, once you win one, it's easier to win others. It's kind of a snowball effect. And so once you're kind of involved in that kind of area of things and you're recognized once or two times, it becomes a lot easier. And so I think in terms of easiest ways of getting funding, hackathons, science fairs, or um, kind of those pitching competitions. Um, and once you do those, you generally meet individuals uh, at, at bigger companies and they offer funding themselves whatever it may be uh, in whatever area um, that's most uh, applicable to your project and so I think those would be the um, the best avenues of getting there in a sense but also you know I was talking about meaningful conversations um, you know it's, it's just about getting yourself out there and people generally are most friendly <laughs> to young people who try are, are doing good work and so uh, maybe you come across uh, by messaging people on LinkedIn or, or emailing individuals who are kind of in your area of work. Those are the easiest ways to get funding. Okay, yes, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Gino, Shriya, or... Yeah, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so my question was focused on your future. Mm -hmm. So you have been developing the different initiatives, different projects, and creating solutions, probably on average once a year, if you come with a new solution. Uh, so right now you're in university. But what do, how do you see Sean after university? Like if focusing on a, speci a specific uh, issue uh, on a holistic approach or what, what, what's shun in about like 10 years from now? That's a good question. Uh, that's something I'm asking myself now, uh, now that I'm graduating in a few months um, and I'm looking at what I'm going to do next year. I have no idea what I'm doing at this fall. Um, at the moment, I'm planning on, on continuing my education. I, I want to be a physician scientist. I want to be a doctor, like a medical doctor, but I also want to have a PhD in research because I love research, but also love helping people in the clinical setting. That's kind of what my undergraduate is focusing on. Funny enough, yesterday I had an interview for Oxford. So, you know, fingers crossed that uh, I can end up doing some neuroscience research there. Um, but at the same time, I don't think I could be fulfilled just doing that. I think whether it be with young scientists and innovators, or whether it be in some other project that focuses on helping young people um, build their projects that's something i i 100 percent want to stay involved with kind of the same roots as pop same roots as um my work with my not for profit i think combining the two gives me more of a holistic view on things that helps me in each you know I, I, better being a better researcher helps me in realizing how i can help other people uh, especially young people realize their projects and through helping young people realize their projects, it gives me a diverse perspective on things when it comes to my research, even though I'm focusing on Alzheimer's disease, funny enough. And um, uh, it's always been like that. And I don't think I'll ever stop, you know, being involved in that sense. So um, yeah, no, thank you for asking that. Yeah. Great. So what I see is we'll expect great things from Sean in the future. Right now we're doing, we're seeing it, but in the future, all the noble points. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm just gonna copy paste um, the questions we were talking about um, to ask yourself on your own time. Uh, Cause I, I, I do think that these questions definitely can help you realize and reflect on what you have now, what are your strengths, but also where you can, you know, um, work on. You know, I, I kind of think it as, you know, if you really want to know how you can improve your life, you sit on your bed and lie down and ask yourself, what can, what's going wrong? And I think you won't like the answer, but that answer is the thing you most need to hear. Um, and, and these questions are kind of like that, but less hurtful and therefore your project. <laughs> so, 
So um, definitely ask yourself that. But uh, I know it's all, I also know it's hard to ask questions on the spot. And so truly like it, Instagram and email is the fastest I usually answer. Um, I'm always on my phone um, listening during online classes. I'd rather be talking to you guys than doing my online classes. So really don't be uh, shy to message me um, with any questions um, or if you have more questions now, but uh, definitely don't be afraid to, um, to message me. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for giving us your precious time. And thank you so much for sharing out those links, all the information um, about your work, and also about how in, how we can go one step at a time when we talk about innovation. The three points that you mentioned are quite important when we actually start working on our project in our area. Uh, even with uh, we at POP who are actually developing these small events or projects for uh, the participants <clears throat> or the people of the POP network to join in. We also have to actually go through that same process because one, our ideas are, we try to make, create new ideas to in, engage people and give them more than what we can. It takes a lot to actually communicate about the program and its importance to them. And uh, of course, it's very, very important to actually keep them engaged by providing them some content, which actually help them to uh, step up their own projects. So thank you so much for giving us so much uh, today. And uh, we hope to keep uh, meeting you again and again. And every time we meet you, you come up with a new innovation in your pocket so that you, know, in you inspire everybody out there. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you to you for the invitation and it was nice seeing you again, uh, Kevin, and to everyone else. Don't be don't be a stranger and uh, and let me know how I could be of service to you uh, by messaging me. And good luck. Good luck in your project. Thank you. Now I would like to hand it over to Kevin who will uh, take us through a presentation uh, about how what activities that we have to do uh, as part of the pop technology conclave. Kevin, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Can you, ah, okay, I'm co-host now. Okay. Can you see my, my presentation? Yes. So um, the thing that I'm going to talk to you about is an idea that we created on this uh, pop conclave. It's an idea so we together as pop movement mem members could do an impact immediately through this pop conclave, but also we could actually create something even bigger. So the idea is um, that we um, do something at our homes and together, uh, as some, if we add up what every one of us is doing, then we could actually do a really important change in the world. So the, the topic is emails. I don't know if you, but for example, on my side, you used to have this crazy idea that I won't delete any email in my life. Because when I was really young, I have my, my grandfather he lived in Germany and Mexico, and he sent me a lot of emails. Uh, and then, well, he died. And so that's how I can keep remembering him by thinking that he, the, his emails, his last emails were, are on, well, on my computer, on the internet. I can actually read them. Okay. The thing is, that was a crazy idea. And for the last almost like 20 years, 25 years, I haven't even opened one of his emails. So I have many emails accounts and one of them, uh, I actually I think I always even boast that I was the, the reason why Hotmail, because my first email was on Hotmail. So why Hotmail began to make even a bigger, have a bigger um, space management of emails because I was always at a limit because all the emails I received, I never delete any of them. Uh, and so when in my life, I open many email accounts and it happened all the time. But that's why uh, 
we have together as top moment, we decided to bring up this idea that we could actually delete emails. So let me tell you that on, on average, uh, people in the whole world, we receive about, uh, oh, sorry, it's a little bit more, 1,000 emails per week. So the comments, uh, but in, that's, that's on average, obviously there's people that receive much more and some that receive less. But what does that represent? It represents a, almost 20,000 uh, carbon footprint, um, yeah, car, yeah, carbon emissions, uh, ton, um, about 20,000 tons uh, of carbon uh, emissions per year. And that's really a big issue. Actually, in, a, in UNAM, a, a Mexican university, um, they made up a study and it's not 20, but almost 30. So yeah, it depends. And obviously the server, uh, it, that because of the server needs to well, save all the emails, but also it needs to every time you open, it, it, it needs energy. And all that, that information obviously depends on where the servers are and if they need uh, electricity provided by fossil fuel burning or solar panels or wind panels, uh, wind turbines. So that's a really important take also into account that everything we do on internet makes a huge impact on the environment. Uh, even the videos we, we see, it's, all, it's about 50 grams of CO2, but if we add up all the videos, and that's a one hour video, so all the videos that we, everyone watches throughout all the year, it's many thousands of, of, of CO2 emissions uh, to the atmosphere. So that's why we need to think about what we do and how we do it. So an idea the UNAM um, makes an, as, as a recommendation is that if you want to chat with someone, instead of sending him an email, call him. But if you need to send an email, uh, you need to uh, 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 attach a presentation, attach a PDF and not a PowerPoint. And if you need to send an email, make it short. Uh, so these are really good uh, recommendations. So how these 16 tons, um, what is the equivalent? You can see that is every 85,000 flights from London to Madrid and 3,000 cars uh, that we take out of, of, of the world and they don't produce, they don't eliminate, um, produce any more uh, carbon emissions in the whole world. Uh, so, it, but that, that car is never again is going to be, to be used. That's what it represents. So that is a really huge impact if we delete our e e emails. So Ivan, as uh, in the last session, a uh, um, question, uh, actually uh, was a task. We should email, uh, delete our emails, and we need to add up how many emails each of us deleted. So my question is, if you already delete some, some emails, if you can actually type on the chat, how many have you deleted from last session last week to today? <laughs> and if you haven't, um, <laughs> Uh, delete, you can delete these to, uh, emails today and we can add that number for tomorrow. So tomorrow, um, we are going to do uh, a really important task starting tomorrow. The idea is that with this information that unnecessary emails equals, um, well, polluting our planet and by deleting it, we are actually protecting our planet what can we come up uh, with that information? So we could actually create some project, for example. Uh, so that's the task that we're going to uh, continue uh, starting to, um, tomorrow uh, throughout the, old, the, the technology pop conclave. So that, tomorrow we'll start with this information and making it uh, useful and doing something with this. So uh, if you may, and type on this chat, on the chat of this um, uh, conversation, uh, type how many emails have you deleted from last week to today? We can actually add, and tomorrow we'll ask the same question, and that's how we're going to start with the, this information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. So the task is, the activity is pretty easy. 
all you have to do is you have to from from today to tomorrow you have to delete emails from your inbox you have to count that and you have to let us know tomorrow that how many emails have you deleted after this we will do one more activity using what uh, numbers you share with us uh, we'll do a activity based on the cumulative figure that we get second uh, we'll have uh, one presentation very much focused on uh, <clears throat> browsers and third we have tomorrow presentation on structure innovation uh, we will also give you some half an hour tomorrow to actually work on specific, uh, uh, you know, projects. Projects, as in, you will get an, uh, you will get project ideas tomorrow, and together as teams in groups, you will have to work on, you know, strategically uh, coming up with new innovative idea to actually address that issue. That will be a group activity. So it would be great if you come and join us with your groups. Yeah. Apart from the presentation by one of the facilitators on structural innovation. So right after this present, uh, right after this session, you may go and start deleting your emails if you don't have any numbers right now to mention. And do not forget to actually keep account of how many emails you are deleting today. So we will meet you tomorrow then. Thank you for coming today.